In a society where partisan politics, performative outrage, and cancel culture are now the norm, what does it mean to be formed in Christ-likeness as citizens and ambassadors of a different kingdom? Today, we continue our five-week series on the invitation of Jesus to be agents of reconciliation and healing in our in-person and online worlds. Rather than adopting a mainstream way of thinking or building our convictions from predetermined partisan presuppositions, we need Jesus-shaped imaginations. Drew Hart, who will be a witness? To continue to seek new correctives, gracious and fair and equitable social practices with patience, peaceableness, truth-telling, and without coercion or violence or disdain. This is what it means to be living as a Christian in the world. Lee Camp, Scandalous Witness. The Gospels all cared about an individual's reconciliation with God, self, and their communities. But the Gospel writers also focused on systemic justice, peace between people groups, and freedom for the oppressed. The good news was both about the coming of the kingdom and the character of that kingdom. Lisa Sharon Harper, The Very Good Gospel. To work for a healing, restorative justice, whether in individual relationships, in international relations, or anywhere in between, is therefore a primary Christian calling. N.T. Wright, simply Christian. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. Well, good morning. Hey friends, you have joined us for week number four of the teaching series, The Politics of Peace. And if you've been joining us for the last uh, number of weeks, you've been realizing that we've been focusing on the how and why as Christ followers, we are uh, called to engage differently in the conversations that we are having in our culture. Whether those conversations happen online, in the social media, or whether they are conversations that occur in person, although in COVID-19, that's a, a bit of a challenge as well. But just how do we interact differently because we are Jesus followers living in a very polarized and divisive culture? What's our calling and how do we approach that differently? And, and today, we want to ask ourselves a question, how do we engage differently in the world of, of politics? Shocking enough, uh, in this series, The Politics of Peace. Now, before we go further, um, this is a safe place, isn't it? I have a confession to make. A confession to make that's probably going to shock you as a pastor at the meeting house. Brace yourself. I love politics. That's right. You heard my confession. It's out there in the public uh, domain. I love politics. I've loved politics for many years since I was a young person. I've enjoyed that aspect of what it means to live in our culture. And I realize as an Anabaptist, as a pastor, as a church leader in our context, that might be difficult for you to hear. Um, so pray for me, uh, pray for Bruxy as he has to work with me and my conversations want to go in that direction a bit more than perhaps the, uh, the direction he'd like to go in, but we have fun time together. Yes, yeah, so this morning, um, I'm focusing on one of the things I like to focus on, and that's what, is it, what does it mean as a Christ follower to ask ourselves the question of how do we engage differently in the political realm as well? You know, there has to be a better way to engage uh, in a polarized and divisive world when it comes to politics as well. There has to be a different way, and that's what we want to, to look at. We can't 
we can't isolate ourselves from this question. Um, sometimes we like to think that we can, but we have to take our cultural context seriously. We have to take our, uh, our timing, our time frame of life and interaction seriously. And within our North American context at the very least and other places in the world for that matter, um, we can't isolate ourselves and say that we're not going to have that conversation. We do have to have that conversation. And so it's important that we think about that for a few minutes this morning. You know, one of the Meeting House core values that is so important to who we are is that is about peace. We are committed to nonviolence, peacemaking, and being agents of reconciliation. And I love the way that that has been crafted. Peacemaking is active, it's involved, it's engaged. Sometimes people think if you're committed to nonviolence or if you're a pacifist, that you're passive. And that's not what it's all about. We are actively pursuing uh, wholeness and peace in relationships and in our communities and in, indeed in our world. And we're agents of reconciliation, that sense of activity and engagement as well. Certainly, our aim is not power or control. You've heard that many times as we've been engaged in teaching, that as we look back through history, what a, what a tragedy we've experienced when we get this wrong, when we are all about power and control and taking sort of uh, over the reins of governmental uh, power. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what it means to be because we're Christ followers, because we're influenced by the teachings of Jesus and the example of Jesus, we're called to, to be uh, reconcilers and agents of reconciliation to make a difference in that particular focus. You know, we're blessed in Canada with um, many different role models for us on this question and in this approach. Two come to my mind that I'll just cite this morning for us, and there are many, many others. I want to certainly uh, acknowledge that as well. One is this gentleman, Tommy Douglas. Do you recognize that? Of course, his name is there, so of course that helps you recognizing Tommy Douglas. Tommy Douglas is an example of being an agent of reconciliation, birthed out of his life experience and his commitment to Christ. Perhaps you realize that Tommy Douglas, who was the NDP leader in Canada in the 60s, the premier of Saskatchewan from the mid 40s uh, through the uh, early 1960s, um, perhaps you realized that um, he was a pastor before he turned politician. I know that's hard to believe, but that was his experience, that he was a Christian, a Christ follower, he was a pastor. And earlier in his life experience, uh, he needed significant medical care. And well before the days of universal health care, uh, and his parents were not in a position to afford health care that he needed on his leg. And it came to the point where one of the surgeons that finally decided to help said to his parents, to Tommy Douglas's parents, if you will let medical students observe my operation, my surgery, then I will actually treat Tommy without charging you, or at least charging you the normal rate. And that experience combined with his, his understanding of what it means to be an agent of reconciliation in our culture because of his faith in Christ, he, he said this that I think was the impetus for his uh, influence in seeing universal healthcare happen in Canada. I felt that no boy should have to depend either for his leg or his life upon the ability of his parents to raise enough money to bring a first-class surgeon to his bedside. And it was while Tommy Douglas was the premier of Saskatchewan that universal health care was introduced into that province. And obviously he added his voice and his influence to seeing it eventually become a Canadian reality. And I realize that we have our problems with health care potentially in Canada. We wish it were even better. But I am thankful, and I've been especially thankful in COVID, that we've had the approach to health care that we have. And that's because of persons like Tommy Douglas, who out, because he decided to be an agent of re reconciliation made a difference. Another person that comes to my mind uh, comes from the East Coast, and that is Viola Desmond. Viola Desmond was a black businesswoman in Nova Scotia uh, who experienced racial discrimination, prejudice, and segregation in the 1940s in that particular province. She was on a business trip uh, away from Halifax to New Glasgow, and she had some time and went into a local theater and that local theater was practicing segregation in the 1940s in Nova Scotia. 
and that uh, um, understandably bothered her as a, as a black woman and, and decided to sit where only whites were supposed to sit. And she was charged and she was uh, up against some legal action. And she went back to her church uh, and counseled with her pastor and church leaders and sisters and brothers in her church as a person of faith, as a Christ follower. And they said, you need to take a stand against racial discrimination. Uh, it's, it's present and unless someone begins to be an agent of change, it's going to only continue. And so Vi Viola Desmond uh, became not only a businesswoman, but a civil rights activist and influenced change. And it's not surprising then that she's on our Canadian $10 bill, Viola Desmond. What a, an appropriate acknowledgement of her role as an agent of reconciliation. I don't know about you, but I actually had to go hunting for a $10 bill because who uses currency very much anymore? Um, but it's so important that we honor and recognize Viola Desmond and her work. If we're going to pursue a politics of peace, we need to begin from a different starting point. Too many followers of Jesus uh, take our cues from partisan politics or cultural views, or we just sort of uh, fall into it by default and we don't understand perhaps what it would mean to engage differently if we are Christ followers. So let's start where we should start, with the acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord and we are guided by his life and his teaching. That's where we start. I'm going to invite you to turn to two different passages of scripture, Colossians chapter one. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, turn to Colossians chapter one. And just in a very few minutes, we're going to flip to the Old Testament, Jeremiah 29. And so you'll want to have your fingers, so to speak, in both of those places because we won't stay long in those passages, but we want to take a look at how this scriptural teaching uh, impacts this conversation of what does it mean to do politics differently. And while you're looking at scripture, just two things that I want to underscore for you uh, this morning. One is, speaking about apps, are you aware that the Meeting House, we have a new app, yoo uh, Shout out to our comms team, our tech team, and both staff and volunteers who have put this new app together. And you can check it out. You can get it from the, either the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, wherever you get your apps, um, or at least those two places. Um, why don't you download our app? You can take notes, you can follow along. Lots of great information on our Meeting House app. So we want to share that with you again this morning. And secondly, questions. We will be, if there's time allows, we'll be taking questions again this morning, Q&A, um, and certainly this afternoon at two o'clock in our after party. But next week, I want to underscore next week, as we wrap up this series on the politics of peace, we want to have an extended Q&A session interacting with the questions that you've sent in or will send in, ask at meetinghouse.com. And so why don't you send those in uh, related to the whole series uh, for our conversation next week when we have the, the teachers gathering together and interacting with your questions and Bruxy will be with us and we look forward to that time. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to send those in either today or for next week. Let's look at Colossians chapter one as our first passage to get our mind around this issue of how does the fact that Jesus is Lord shape this conversation? I want to read these verses to, uh, for us from Colossians chapter one, beginning to read at verse 15. And Paul, the apostle, writing to the church of Colossae is talking about Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus, the importance of Jesus, that Jesus is king. And we sang that in our worship, musical worship time this morning, that Christ is our king. And that's what uh, Paul is talking about. He writes, he, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus was involved significantly in creation. All that we have come to realize in terms of our world, the natural world, the physical world, the spiritual world, the human world, Paul is saying that uh, occurred because of Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul is under underscoring that not only at the beginning of time, but in terms of all of time, Jesus is, sust is a sustainer of life, all of life. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the, be the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. 
we know that Jesus is Lord in the church, at least he's supposed to be, uh, acknowledged as, as the head of the church, he is our Lord. But Paul is already telling us that he's Lord in the context of creation. He is Lord in the context of, of sustaining life as we know it. And then we read this. For, in every, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and in verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And that passage in, chap, in, in verse 20 is so absolutely crucial to this conversation that we read that through him, God is working through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, things on earth, things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. What is Paul doing here? Paul is um, opening up a cosmic curtain, if you will, and giving us a glimpse of the supremacy of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus, the king enthroned, and wanting the church at Colossae, and us for that matter, to understand what are the implications if Jesus is reconciling all things to himself. And you know, the importance of those two words, I can't be underscored, all things, not just the spiritual dimension, which is obviously a part of his reconcili uh, reconciliation work, his forgiveness, his healing, his wholeness, spiritually in our relationship with God, but also in our relationship with other people. And Paul has already referenced creation, already referenced sustaining all things. And in Paul's mind and in his teaching, he recognizes the sort of the holistic cosmic nature of Jesus' mission to reconcile, to bring healing, to bring wholeness, that which was broken because of our disobedience and wanting to go our own way in the fall. As we read that story in Genesis, Jesus is set to set things to rights. It's been started, it's not finished, but that's an important truth for us to be recognizing that if Jesus is at work by his spirit to reconcile all things uh, within the context of what we understand through creation, then it's important for us to acknowledge that. We shouldn't be surprised by that really because this was Jesus' calling card in Luke chapter uh, four. The very beginning of his ministry, Jesus already signaled that his ministry, his reconciling work would be holistic. Let's look at this uh, passage of scripture for a brief second. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And obviously, if you look at that passage and study that passage in Luke, Jesus was referencing back to Isaiah chapter 61, which was also referencing Leviticus 25, all about the year of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor when debts would be canceled, when people would return to a sense of, of their, their sense of their property, their ability to live life more holistically and flourish in a more uh, significant way. And Jesus was saying, I have come to engage holistically with people. Again, this doesn't negate our need for spiritual freedom and spiritual healing and to be set free from spiritual oppression. Oh, thank God. Thank God for that. That's so crucial and primary. But we see not only in Luke chapter four, but throughout the teachings and the life of Jesus, that what did he begin to do to model that his reconciling work engaged all of life, all aspects of cultural engagement, when he performed his healing miracles and touched people and embraced people, marginalized people, people who wouldn't have been included uh, in conversations and interactions before, Jesus brought them close. He welcomed them to the table. He brought healing to their lives. I love this quote by Lisa Sher Sharon Harper um, from the book, The Very Good Gospel. The gospels all cared about an individual's reconciliation with God, self and their communities. But the gospel writers also focused on systematic justice, peace between people groups and freedom for the oppressed. The good news was both, was both about the coming of the kingdom and the character of that kingdom. And I think that uh, and sort of captures the aspect of Jesus' ministry as being holistic. So that's a starting point, that Jesus is Lord and he's reconciling all things to himself. 
But the second uh, critical truth is that Jesus calls us to be his ambassadors of reconciliation. This is not what Jesus is just doing um, by himself in the spiritual realm. He's doing that by his spirit. He's active in our world. He's active in all aspects of our culture and engagement. And we see that if we're sensitive and looking. But then he says, I want you involved. You as a Christ follower, the church. I want you involved in this reconciling mission. And that's where uh, this conversation really takes a focal point in terms of how do we engage differently. We start with a conversation about what it means to contribute to reconciliation and wholeness and peace and justice in our culture. Not questions of control and dominance, but how do we make a difference to bring wholeness to the lives of people in our context and in our communities. Paul says very clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And if you're like me, when you first hear that, you think, well, of course, that is again our, our, our challenge, our invitation to share the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, and to invite other persons, spiritually curious people, to check Jesus out, to research uh, what Jesus claimed about himself, and to understand that Jesus offers a sense of inner peace and spiritual freedom. That's our mission. But if Jesus is Lord of all things, and recon reconciling all things to himself. If Jesus' ministry was holistic uh, to the poor and to the oppressed and to those that were struggling with all kinds of brokenness in relationships and in communities, if he is bringing peace in, a, in our communities, then our ministry is also needing to be holistic as we ask ourselves that question. And that's where I want to turn to Jeremiah 29. Because Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah, is a really good example for us. And maybe you've heard this passage of scripture before. I want to read Jeremiah 29, four, and it's gonna be on uh, your screen here. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have called you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And that verse seven is so critical. Seek the peace, seek the welfare. The Hebrew word is shalom of your city, of your context. And this was about 600 BC. This was a message to the people of Jerusalem, Jewish people who had been taken from Jerusalem in exile as they had been conquered, which was often the pattern in uh, the ancient Near East, where a conquered persons were often uh, um, experienced exile and placed in different, in different places. And God was saying to these persons, to these Jewish persons living in exile, living in a difficult place, I want you to seek the welfare, the shalom of the city. And he gave just very everyday, common day uh, ways of doing that. Plant your gardens, build your families, build your houses, engage in the commercial, uh, cultural life of your city in this particular way. And I think that's our challenge. Yes, we are ambassadors. Yes, because our citizenship is in the kingdom of God, the Jesus nation. We're not first and foremost Canadians. We're not first and foremost citizens of this particular earthly nation. We too, like the people of Israel in Jeremiah 29, are exiled to a certain degree. We're foreigners and aliens, as scripture tells us. But the message is clear, both in Jeremiah 29 and to today, that as agents of reconciliation, that doesn't mean we isolate and withdraw and just stay in our own community. That means we're also called to seek the shalom, the peace, the reconciliation that God wants to bring about uh, in our particular community at this time, and it's holistic. So whether it's the arts or education or social agencies or business or political engagement, we can seek the peace of our communities in a uh, myriad of ways, and that's our calling. Hey, I want us to watch an interview that I engaged with, with Dr. Ron Sider uh, several days ago. Ron Sider is a longtime theologian coming out of the Brethren in Christ, Be in Christ, 
uh, Anabaptist world. So he's, he's committed to peace and nonviolence. He's a part of our tribe, so to speak. Um, and he's written this book, Just Politics. If you really want a, a good book on the whole issue, Just Politics, um, from an Anabaptist perspective, I think you would find that very good. And I interviewed Ron because of his leading voice in this whole question. And I want us to just uh, uh, listen to this interview as a part of the conversation this morning. We've been engaged over the last number of weeks in a teaching series entitled The Politics of Peace. What does it mean to engage as Christ followers in relationships, in the social um, media context, in other, in other arenas? What does it mean to engage differently um, as Christ followers? I'm interested, Ron, in your perspective, politics of peace. Uh, do those go together? I think so. I think they do. But I understand, respect people who question that. Um, one of my wonderful favorite uh, uh, Ontario uh, BIC um, bishops, um, I think um, a cousin, uh, Bishop Roy Sider, used to say that he, he never voted because he thought that voting for someone meant that you endorsed everything that that person uh, promoted. I think that's not the case. Voting for someone simply means that you think that person is better than the other person, or to put it negatively, not quite as bad as the other person. But there's, a, I think, a really important theological reason for engaging in politics, and that is that politics is enormously influential. Uh, it affects people for good or ill by the millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions, Think of uh, what happened because Christians voted for Hitler uh, in 1933 in Germany. Think of the good that happened because the um, evangelical uh, parliamentarian Wilberforce worked to end the slave trade uh, and then slavery itself in the British Empire. So politics is really important. It affects the lives of people. And in fact, theologically, it's important to see that politics, wise, just politics, is one of the important ways we love our neighbor. Um, if we do it badly, we hurt our neighbor. If we do it well, uh, we help our neighbor. Now, I think if we're committed to Jesus' teaching that we should never kill, then as pacifists, we're not very likely to ever be elected to significant office because we'll have to say that we're not going to vote um, or endorse um, measures, expenditures, and so on that will involve killing. But that doesn't mean we can't be engaged politically politically. We can be deeply engaged, as I've been uh, uh, all my life. Um, uh, we can, one way to do it is to, in fact, simply take the just war criteria, which is what most Christians and most politicians say uh, provide their framework for thinking about um, uh, how to use force. And we can argue that, in fact, on the basis of the just war criteria, this kind of military action or this kind of violence would not be justified. We can also, and this is a different kind of approach, to, we can also suggest non-lethal approaches to uh, problems. We need police, but uh, they could uh, do it much, much more non-violently than they do certainly here in the U.S. Um, uh, taser guns, uh, com community policing, you know, on and on. And then uh, we can also vote for the less violent, the less dangerous candidate. So I think there are a number of ways that uh, people with our understanding of Jesus called to love our enemies can be engaged politically and really in important ways love our neighbor and produce good out outcomes. Hmm. Uh, that's really helpful. I, I appreciate those reflections. Um, when, when we think about it in the context of a very polarized culture, both in Canada and the United States and elsewhere, um, Maybe more specifically, do you have any thoughts on how do we avoid just contributing to polarization and frustration? How, how do we engage in a way that might be perceived as a third way between the polarities that we see in our culture? Yeah, well, I've been struggling with that <laughs> big time in the last months here in the, uh, the U.S. Um, I think one thing we need to say is that we need to respect people who disagree with us. Uh, and we need to say we want to listen to and learn from people who disagree with us. If we understand that 
we're limited, finite, that our understanding is far less than perfect, to put it very mildly, uh, then we should understand that probably some people who disagree with us politically have some ideas that have merit. Uh, and so if, um, if we can really listen and learn from them, uh, that helps us but it also makes a huge contribution to the body politic. One of the things that's most dangerous uh, in this country, in the U.S. now, is that we have an enormous division uh, and very little trust or dialogue across that division. And it seems to me that biblical Christians who understand their own finitude uh, and their own imperfection uh, and... Uh, will therefore be leading in listening to and dialoguing across those deep divisions. You've mentioned the U.S. context a couple of times, Ron. Um, we're all very well aware <laughs> that you have just gone through a U.S. presidential election, uh, and there's still a lot of tension uh, in the air as a result of that. Um, Share with us some of the reflections that you've been having leading up to the election, the election itself, uh, these several days following the election. What are you reflecting on in light of that whole experience? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is that by about a five million vote uh, margin, uh, Joe Biden uh, has uh, clearly won a very, very divisive um, election campaign. And I think that victory is important. I think he will restore some genuine respect and dignity uh, and some wise policies going forward. But it's also true that the country is enormously divided. Uh, Donald Trump won more votes uh, than he won in 2016. So there's just huge division. My ongoing role is to beg God to show me how to contribute to real dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope and pray that somehow in the white evangelical world, we can um, uh, talk together in a new way, um, stop saying awful things about each other, um, I don't think the pro-life evangelicals for Biden did that, but uh, there were there was a very prominent, uh, very prominent evangelical pastor in the U.S. who said that the only evangelicals who would vote for uh, Biden had quote sold their souls to the devil. Uh, I, I weep over the radical, harsh division um, in in the church, and. One of the most crucial things going forward is just the issue of racism. It's, it's perfectly clear that there's been a long history of white evangelical racism, uh, not just decades, but centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and we haven't adequately uh, confessed that or dealt with it uh, at, at a kind of superficial level. We say, yeah, we, we don't want to be racist, but there's little understanding of the structural racism that continues to be there in policing and the educational system uh, and so on. And so I, I especially hope and pray that we can work at that. Uh, African-American uh, Christians, they're just as evangelical as white evangelicals in terms of their basic theology, uh, but they just um, are horrified at uh, what white evangelicals have been doing um, for a long time, but especially in the last uh, four years. So I, I want to work and pray at those things. Uh, I'm not very clear on exactly how to do that in an effective way, but I hope God will show me. Well, thanks so much, Ron, for taking time to interact with me this morning and just reflecting uh, after many years of thought and study and engagement on this whole conversation. I appreciate it and uh, pray that you will continue to be encouraged as you give leadership um, in your way in the context of the U.S. So thanks so very much. Gladly and oh Canada, bless you all.
Thanks to Ron for engaging in that particular conversation. Um, Ron is a retired theology professor at uh, Palmer Theological Seminary in the U.S., so his context is there. Um, also, if you'd like to follow uh, his blog, he continues to write. Uh, those uh, That direction or how you can connect to that blog is in your notes, so I invite you to uh, check that out as well as a potential source of understanding. Um, maybe we'll just pause for a moment and see if there's a question that's come in that we can engage with. Thanks, Daryl. There's lots of engagement here, and I want to uh, ask you one question that has come in, and it is this. How do we navigate gentle political conversation, especially as we get closer to the holidays, when it feels like we don't have good examples? The U.S. seems further and further divided, and Canada may be seen as politely avoidant. Hmm. That's a really... That's an important question, and I think it actually serves as a great segue to some of the practical tips on engagement that I'd like to, to move towards. So maybe as a way of answering that question uh, and others that you might have, let's just take a few minutes to think of some very practical ways that we can not only engage with that question, but some of the other questions. Just what does this mean for us very practically if we're to be agents of reconciliation? Thanks for that question, and hope that these uh, tips get at that, uh, get an answer to that. I think uh, when we think practically speaking, well, what does this mean? What should I do? Where should I start? Um, let me start where we should start, and that's prayer. Uh, I think that's a often forgotten uh, thing that we should be engaging in, a way, a method that we should be engaging in in terms of political engagement. We are called on to pray, uh, and that's such a huge important starting point, whether it's in the question of personal conversations or uh, wanting to see change happening in, happen in our culture, in our communities, uh, let's, let's start by being praying people, uh, seeking God's enablement, God's wisdom, God's insight into how to see reconciliation occur, how to bridge the divides that we're experiencing. Uh, Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's a clear challenge for us, invitation for us to be praying. And obviously other scriptures, 1 Timothy 2 comes to mind where we are very specifically uh, invited to pray for our uh, political leaders, our governmental leaders. And so let's, let's pray. Um, and one of the resources I'd love to steer you toward in terms of prayer and how prayer makes a difference in this conversation is our friends at 24-7 uh, Prayer Canada. Check out their website at 247prayercanada.com. Just a, a lot of resources and how we can be praying about issues of reconciliation and justice and pursuing wholeness in our culture. Prayer walks. A shout out to our High Park Parish. I know they've engaged in prayer walks in their communities. And friends, that's an important way of seeking reconciliation, making a difference in our culture. Uh, secondly, be a faithful presence in your community. Be a faithful presence in your community. Sometimes we think on big national, international levels, not that those aren't important, but most of us live in our neighborhoods, in our communities. Let's start there. I love this quote by James Davison Hunter. The call to a faithful presence gives priority to what is right in front of us, the community, the neighborhood, and the city where we learn forgiveness and humility, practice kindness, hospitality and charity, grow in patience and wisdom, and become clothed in compassion, gentleness and joy. This is the context in which shalom is enacted. Doesn't that remind you of Jeremiah 29? This is where we have our gardens. This is where we build our houses, interacting with our neighbors and seeing the needs right in our own community. Be a faithful presence right where you are. That's why I'm so excited about our parish mindedness that we've been talking about as a church family over the last several months. I believe more than ever we are called to have our neighborhoods and our communities on our mind to be a part of the solution to wholeness and reconciliation in our own backyards. Not again to take over or be dominating and, and controlling, but to be persons who care about the needs in our communities, holistic needs in our communities. And I love the examples of how our parishes are doing that in creative ways. But you are very well aware, and if you're not, let's do our research on issues of need in our communities. There are many. It could be refugees. It could be homelessness. It could be racism and issues there of racial reconciliation that we need to be pursuing. It could be environmental issues. It could be issues of poverty. Um, the list is many. 
And so let's engage in local presence. Let's be contributing to the needs in our neighborhoods and in our communities. And as God gives us opportunity, we can also help seek peace and wholeness and reconciliation on other levels as well. What does it mean to be engaged in your local parish? What does it mean for your home church to be a kingdom outpost, so to speak? I'm excited that we have over 100 kingdom outposts as, meeting house, as a Meeting House Church family right across Ontario, making a difference in our communities. What could your home church be doing to continue to have this kind of a conversation? Let me say this yet. Let's consider social service before we get too excited about social media. Social media has its place, but if it's a replacement to actually doing something with your food bank or with refugees in your community or in poverty, then I think we've missed the mark. Let's engage in social service just as much as we engage in social media. Number three, decide to love even when you disagree. I think this maybe gets at that question. How do we decide to love even when we disagree? How can we be agents of re reconciliation and resist polarization? I think it begins with understanding that there are elements of truth and insight across the political landscape, whether it be the left or the center or the right, if that's helpful labeling, which it often isn't. There are, there are places of understanding and truth and we want to be able to seek that and ask about that. I think we should be engaging in dialogue and questions. Why are you thinking that? Why are you motivated in that direction? Help me understand your perspective better because that's not where I'm coming from. And we enter into dialogue and we decide to love even when we disagree. Because our enemies aren't other human beings. Our enemies against ideas, potentially against other forces, uh, Paul tells us, that divide us and destroy us. And so we see that other person that we're in dialogue with, uh, potentially uh, not agreeing with, um, as someone who's loved and cared for by God as well, I want to seek understanding. And I want to be the first to build a bridge to dialogue. Let's take the initiative and be bridge builders, not bridge burners. And finally, keep perspective. Jesus is Lord. Yes, engagement is important. We've been talking about it all morning. There's a place for engagement. There's a place for government. It has its role to contribute to the common good. But at the end of the day, Jesus will bring in the fullness of the kingdom. And whether our side wins, so to speak, or whether our ideas are taken up, let's always remember that Jesus is Lord. Let's keep perspective. I love that old hymn in the church we, that we sing at times still, this phrase in that hymn, this is my father's world. And though the wrong seems off so strong, he is the ruler yet. Keep perspective. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you are Lord. I thank you that you are at work by your spirit to bring reconciliation in all things in our, in our world. We get discouraged when we don't see that but we know that you are at work and you have called us into that reconciling work. Lord, help us to do it in a different way, in a way that brings shalom, wholeness, healing, and hope rather than division, discouragement, and despair. Thank you that you are with us. We acknowledge again today that you are Lord. You are the ruler yet. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hi, I'm Brexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.